the message is, is, is trying to explain how important coastal Louisiana is, not just to South Louisiana and the coastal communities, but to the entire state and to the entire country. Uh, the role it plays from an energy perspective, from a seafood perspective, uh, the role it plays in terms of uh, commerce and, and the ability of, of manufacturers and companies and small businesses all over this nation um, to be able to compete on a global market. It, much of it is tied back to uh, the Mississippi River, our ability to efficiently transport products around the world, and, uh, and really just showing that the, the coastal challenges we're having here with land loss and with vulnerability to hurricanes it isn't a parochial problem, not a Louisiana problem, not a regional problem. It is a national crisis that needs to be addressed with urgency. Louisiana's national role. Um, why, why is the coast important? I think going back 200 years ago and looking what Thomas Jefferson said about New Orleans, he said that he recognized 200 years ago that three-eighths of our nation's produce must pass through New Orleans to go to market. And I want to point out at that time, that meant our young nation. That meant the area that, that, that constituted the United States at the time was the area to the east of the Mississippi River. And so Thomas Jefferson, the president, directed Monroe and Livingston to go acquire New Orleans because he understood the strategic importance of New Orleans to the future westward growth, to the future of our nation, and how it could become an absolute choke point for the growth of our, of our young country uh, had it not been under the control, had, had, should it not be under the control of the United States. And so he sent them over to Europe to go acquire New Orleans. Well, everybody knows the rest of that story. Monroe and Livingston went over there, uh, they were authorized and they had the funding to buy New Orleans. They ended up acquiring the entire Louisiana Purchase. Um, uh, extraordinary increase in the size of our nation. And, and I think it's an important thing to point out that a lot of people um, look at Louisiana as being unethical and, and, and our politicians as, as being corrupt, but this dates back well before Louisiana politicians came in. These guys acquired New Orleans, uh, excuse me, acquired the entire Louisiana Purchase without the authorization or the funding, and so it's something that we inherited here in Louisiana. But, but, but taking a look at what Thomas Jefferson predicted, was he right? Well, is, is South Louisiana that important? This shows the combined truck traffic coming out of the ports of New York and New Jersey. These red lines here, the thicker the volume lines, the, uh, the, the thicker the lines, the higher the volume of traffic. It shows the extraordinary traffic coming out of those ports and going out through all 48 states in the, uh, in, in the lower, uh, in the continental United States. This is what happens with Los Angeles, uh, ports of Long Beach. Um, take a look at that. You can see even, even more growth coming across the Midwest, uh, higher volumes. This is Houston, and this is New Orleans. And then if you take the ports in Louisiana and combine them, you end up with this. You simply can't replicate, you can't replicate the intermodal importance of South Louisiana. Th this is absolutely extraordinary. And you go, and, and that's just truck traffic. If you go over to the maritime side, this, this uh, graphic right here shows the inland waterway traffic that comes through the waterways in the United States. Well, look where you have the highest volume by far, coming straight through our ports in Louisiana, up our river system, and going up into the, uh, into the Midwest. Um, look at these small lines in California. Look at the small lines on the East Coast. Where you see the highest volume of traffic is coming up our river systems and coming across the Gulf Intracoastal Waterway all in Louisiana. Thomas Jefferson was right. So today, we have the top tonnage port in the nation. We have five of the top 15 ports in the country, right here in South Louisiana. Largest cargo uh, port complex in the world. Nearly 20% of all waterborne commerce in this nation comes through South Louisiana. And over 30 states depend upon our port systems for imports and exports. Going over to the energy side, and I'm going I'm to re-emphasize the national importance of Louisiana. We're, the, we're one of the top producers of domestic oil. We have the top reserves of recoverable oil and gas in our offshore waters. We're the top producer of offshore oil, the number two, two, number two producer of offshore gas. We have, we have an incredible potential for, for alternative and uh, uh, energy production. And when you look at, at the, all this energy production cumulatively in the Gulf of Mexico offshore our state, We've generated somewhere in the neighborhood of $150 billion for the United States Treasury. It is one of the largest sources of income after taxes for the U.S. government. And so you look down here at the bottom, it talks about one of the largest sources of revenue for the U.S. Treasury. In some years, our states contributed around $5 billion in revenue to the U.S. Treasury. 
And I'm going to talk a little bit more about its importance later. Uh, this is a little difficult to see, but all of these are actually lines showing the energy infrastructure in the Gulf of Mexico. In South Louisiana, we have tens of thousands of miles uh, of, of, of energy infrastructure, of pipelines going all through our coastal area, going through our coastal waters, and in South Louisiana. It is one of the largest concentrations of energy infrastructure in the world. Going over to the seafood side, um, we're the top producer of seafood in the continental United States. We bring in more oysters, blue crab, shrimp, and crawfish than anywhere else in the country. And, and shrimp is one of the most, is the most consumed seafood in the nation. And, and we produce the wild shrimp right here in uh, South Louisiana more so than anywhere else. Uh, what happens in Louisiana? What's at risk right here in our state? Commercial fishermen. Hundreds of thousands of Louisianans depend upon that in industry. It's a very unique part of our culture. We have the best food in the nation in the restaurants because of the fresh, wild, abundant seafood that we have here. We have the most productive ecosystem producing all these, these uh, uh, different species of, of seafood. Um, we're the fourth top recreational fishing destination in the nation. A lot of people think it's because we're just really good fishermen and it's because we have really productive ecosystem. Um, but, but, but the implications on losing this are on bait shops, marinas, tackle suppliers, restaurants, and hotels. What's at risk? The recovery from Hurricanes Rita, uh, uh, Katrina, Rita, Gustav, and Ike. Um, the, the, the coastal systems, the communities, the economies that are tied to that. The, the, the unique way of life and heritage we have here in Louisiana. And, and fundamentally destroying the ecosystem and the, local, and the coastal resources. 40% of the marshlands in the continental United States are in Louisiana. Uh, uh, extraordinary percentage of waterborne commerce, and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service says that the fishery supported by this area remains the most productive in North America. 90% of the species in the Gulf of Mexico are dependent upon coastal Louisiana's estuary for survivability. 90%. 98% of all commercially harvested species are dependent upon our coastal estuary. Going over to the, to the migratory birds and waterfowl, tens of millions of birds choose Louisiana as a wintering habitat. The, the, the largest wintering habitat for migratory birds in the United States. 70 rare, threatened, and endangered species. Coastal wetlands serve as a buffer uh, and retention area from storm surge. And, and um, I think that the high water event was a perfect example of that, is how the wetlands can retain water. And I think that's one of the reasons why we didn't see the, the flood prediction models uh, be realized, is because the wetlands were able to retain so much of the, of the water in the Atchafalaya Basin in St. Mary Parish and over in Terrebonne. Um, two million people live in South Louisiana. Um, it's the majority of our state's economy. The business is there, uh, incredibly productive. Uh, the most productive fisheries in the continental United States, hundreds of billions of dollars in infrastructure related to the energy industry and many, many other areas and a very unique culture and way of life. So what's happened since Hurricane Katrina? What changes have been put in place? What lessons have we learned? One of the most important things we've learned is that we can no longer just try and build walls or levees and try and block the water out, to try to prevent the water from getting into our communities. To try to pretend like it doesn't exist anymore and, and, and trying to forget what's on the other side of those levees. We now are approaching things fundamentally differently. Where we're taking a system approach to everything that we do. Recognizing the importance of restoring our barrier islands and the role it plays in tempering storm surge and stopping the energy of salt water intruding into our ecosystem. Restoring our coastal forests and our, and our brackish marsh areas. Restoring our natural ridges and chenilles. Looking at ways of actually trying to build our highways in coastal Louisiana, which are often some of your higher ridges, in a manner that will complement your protection and restoration efforts. Continuing to use floodgates and levees, improving building standards and zoning to where you elevate the homes as a complement to your protection efforts, and of course, letting folks know when it's time to evacuate. Fundamentally different approach. And, and, and we've made some pretty impressive progress. This is a western closure complex in Lower Jefferson Parish uh, near Plaquemine. It's, a, it's about a billion dollar structure, the largest pump station in the world. This right here is about a two mile uh, wall with navigation gates that um, goes across what's known as the Golden Triangle. That's the city of New Orleans right there. This is the Gulf Intracoastal Waterway. This is the Mississippi River Gulf Valley. 
What happened during Hurricane Katrina is that the water went up against the levees on the MRGO and the Gulf Intracoastal Waterway. You had 22 feet of water plowed into the city of New Orleans and, and ended up causing uh, extraordinary damage. This is Lake Pontchartrain. You had storm surge coming down through there and it just met and wreaked havoc on New Orleans. These projects were not conceived before Hurricane Katrina, not, not even on the back of a napkin. Both of these projects, as you can see, are being realized today. And we're investing $15 billion in repairs and revisions to the Greater New Orleans Hurricane Protection System to improve the resiliency of New Orleans, of Jefferson Parish, St. Charles, Plaquemines, and St. Bernard, uh, recognizing the importance of those areas to, to, to our future economy. This is the Mississippi River Gulf Outlet, the closure. We've closed the Hurricane Highway. Now, I want to be clear. Um, this, was, this was done in about two years, and this is about seven feet above sea level. It's not a, it's not a wall, but this is important because number one, this served as a major conduit for saltwater intrusion that got all up into the New Orleans, uh, St. Bernard areas and, and caused the loss of hundreds of thousands of acres of wetlands in coastal Louisiana and opened up and exposed New, the greater New Orleans area directly to storm surge. Um, and, and pretty impressive it was done so quickly. Um, East Grand Terre, we, we, we built 40 acres of dune uh, East Grand Terre is just over uh, fr from Grand Isle, just over to the east from Grand Isle, um, two, two islands over. Um, able to, to create back barrier marsh and restoration habitats. And Little Lake, 2,100 feet of rock dike and open water, creating 4,400, excuse me, 4,488 uh, acres of, of new marsh and nourishing an additional 500 acres. Um, Pass Chalon, Bejo Wise area, we moved 2.6 million cubic yards of dredge material. Uh, to, to restore uh, a thousand foot marsh platform, 1.5 million uh, cubic yards of dredge material, creating beach and dunes, and we dredged 4,200 uh, foot long channel to maintain the, the, the uh, channel between Pashalon and Bejo Wise here. This, all this area, this was supposed to be a bay right here, and what had happened is all this was gone. It was all opened up, and so you had salt water getting all into this area that was changing uh, th this entire area with, with wave action and storm surge. And we're able to restore this entire area. It's pretty fascinating going out there today. Um, Bayou DuPont, this was, this was a first. We built a pipeline in the Mississippi River and mined sediment out of the Mississippi River, pumped it over the levees, and we built over 500 acres of marsh directly from river sediment, new sediment getting out into Bayou DuPont, just uh, below Jefferson Parish and Plaquemines. Morganza of the Gulf, this is the largest non-federal coastal project in our state's history. About $250 million is being invested. This is the only metropolitan area in South Louisiana without hurricane protection. The Corps of Engineers was first tasked to do this in 1992, and they haven't turned the first piece of dirt. 1992. They finished reports on, on recommendations on how to do this in 2001 and again in 2002. They've been authorized by Congress to proceed with this project three times. Three times, and haven't turned the first piece of dirt. Meanwhile, again, you have the, 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 the Homa Terrebonne area, uh, one of the fastest growing areas in our state in terms of the economy that, um, that, that remains vulnerable. It's not okay. And in uh, June, we got approval to build um, the, the sand barriers, the sand berms in South Louisiana. Um, in November, we reached an agreement with BP to dedicate $100 million to the fortification of those berms for Pelican Island, Schofield Island, Shell Island. I want to show you what this looks like. This is actually the berm over in the Chandelier Island side on the east side off, off uh, Plaquemines Parish, excuse me, off St. Bernard Parish. This right here, you're looking south. This is the northernmost point of the Chandelier Islands right there, okay? This is all that's left of the Chandelier Islands. In the 1960s, they had fishing camps. People would live there for the summer, uh, okay? That's all that's left. So this was June 17th. This was August 28th. I'm gonna go back and show that again. This is where we just started dredging, right there. That's our dredge, uh, that's where the dredge pipe is coming out. So June 17th, August 28th, October 2nd. And now you're looking in the other direction. Now you're looking toward the north. That right there, that little island right there, is that. So you can see the incredible change. You can see what's doable and look at Look at, this is, uh, th this is the east side right here. So this is where the Gulf of Mexico is sending in all this wave energy. And look what it's doing, breaking the wave energy, collecting the oil, and you have smooth water over here. Um, this is April 13th. 
So uh, just again, folks express concern about its sustainability. I want to note that, that it's still there. We moved 19 million cubic yards of dredge material in about six months. 19 million. Broke records. We built about 18 miles. The Corps of Engineers have been authorized to, to restore barrier islands, uh, to, to build barrier islands for years now. The first piece of dirt has not turned. We did this in six months and there wasn't even a plan to do it. 18 miles, 19 million cubic yards. One other thing we've done is we've, we've, we've integrated all of our restoration and protection features. Uh, Governor Blanco laid a great groundwork for us to begin working on that integration. After Katrina, there was recognition that we could no longer manage coastal restoration, hurricane protection, flood control in, in, in different stovepipes and different offices. And Governor Blanco in 2007 issued a master plan for the coast, the first time ever looking at how to bring together restoration, protection, economic sustainability, ecosystem production, and, our, and, and preserving our unique culture in South Louisiana. And they did a fantastic job. And so we have actually taken that and built upon it. We integrated parts of Department of Transportation, parts of Department of Natural Resources, parts of Department of Functions of Wildlife and Fisheries, and integrated them all into one office. Before the oil spill, we had a 2,300% increase in work, and we've added 12 people before the oil spill. And, and now we're the lead trustee for the oil spill. But I want to show this to you. This isn't, this isn't mine. This is U.S. Geological Survey. This was a report that was just released last, last month. This shows you the land loss that we've experienced in Louisiana since the 1930s. Okay? All these are square miles of land that's been lost. Um, this is 2008 right there. And, and as a result of the work of, of Governor Blanco, as a result of the investments that were made with Governor Jindal and the legislature and uh, the, some of the federal efforts we've been able to accomplish in recent years, the, the Coastal Impact Assistance Program, offshore energy revenue sharing to a very small degree so far. Um, we, we have dedicated so far uh, about $1.7 billion into restoration and protection, exponentially increasing the amounts that were put forth in the past. And, and I want to be clear, this is preliminary. But, but it's, a, it's, a pretty good, it's a pretty good indication that we can be successful here. It's a pretty good indication that this is a wise investment. Challenges remain. Um, we've got to, and I know you had a speaker here last week. The speaker said diversions are a mess and they're not productive and not helpful. Nothing could be further from the truth. The Mississippi River, the Atchafalaya River built South Louisiana, built everything you see in this picture here. And until we reconnect the river with the adjacent wetlands, as Chuck noted, uh, we're, we're going to be coastal territory. We'll be coastal property right here in Baton Rouge. It's not an option. It's absolutely not an option. We've got to reestablish the diversions, re reconnect the river with the adjacent wetlands. And when you do that, you have all kinds of winds. You have the wind that when next time we have a high water event, we don't need to worry about flooding the, the Atchafalaya floodway through Morganza. We can open up our diversions and send the water out into the areas that are sediment starved and freshwater starved, like the Barataria Basin. Get it over into Terrible and Paris from the Atchafalaya, where they need the nutrients and need the fresh water. In addition, when you divert that water out, you send the, the nutrients, the phosphates and nitrates from the Mississippi and Atchafalaya River that are coming from the farms in the Midwest. You send it out into the wetlands. The wetland plants actually benefit from it. It's fertilizer. So you impre in increase, improve the wetland plants. In addition, you're sending sediment out of the river. The Corps of Engineers today has a $95 million funding shortage for dredging the Mississippi River. Let's get the sediment out of the river. We need it out of the river. That's another win. You can restore the wetlands. You can benefit the wetland plants. You can suck out the, the nitrates and phosphates that cause our dead zone every year. You can reduce the dredging the Corps of Engineers need, needs to do every year on the lower river system. And you can reduce the threat of flooding from future high water events. There's no downside to this. Diversions make sense. Right now, and, and I think the speaker last week referred to the West Bay, uh, West Bay diversion and called it a failure. I have pictures that were taken about two weeks ago where folks are standing in ankle deep water in an area that just two years ago was probably eight feet deep. They're ankle deep water today as a result of this recent high water event. 
Um, we have to fundamentally remanage the river. It's not just about flood control like the levees, and it's not just about the navigation channels. The river, South Louisiana, is not sustainable under the current management regime. It's causing the loss of wetlands every single day, and it needs to fundamentally be changed by the Corps of Engineers. Um, here are our two options. This was a study that was done in late 2009 showing the coastline of Louisiana in, a, in about 100 years. So the good news is that the, the drive to good saltwater fishing from Baton Rouge has been cut. The bad news is that New Orleans is underwater, Port Fouchon is underwater, Galliano is underwater, La Rose is underwater, Terrebonne Parish is underwater, Plaquemines and St. Bernard are underwater. This isn't an option. So what I'd like to leave you with is this. If you're a sportsman and you care about being a sportsman, you care about wildlife, this is the most productive ecosystem on our continent, right here in South Louisiana. This is the largest habitat for migratory waterfowl in North America, right here in coastal Louisiana. There's more commercial seafood produced here than anywhere else in the continental United States. Maybe you care about historical preservation. Fort Pike, Fort Jackson, Fort Livingston, they're all crumbling before our eyes. The largest concentration, one of the largest concentrations of historical structures, right here in New Orleans, right here in South Louisiana, all that's at risk. Maybe you care about the economy, you care about jobs, you care about trade. 20% of our waterborne commerce comes right here through our river system. Five of the top 15 ports in the nation, one in every seven jobs in our state are tied back to this river system. 31 states depend upon it for economic, uh, for, for maritime commerce. And as a matter of fact, the Mississippi River is America's commerce superhighway. It is the most efficient means of transportation in terms of getting products out of the United States. Because it's more efficient than other means of transportation, there's no secret that it's more expensive to do business in the United States because of our labor laws, our envir environmental laws, and our tax code. The Mississippi River's efficiency gives us a strategic advantage to compete on the global markets. We've got to maintain it. And with the widening of the, of the Panama Canal, South Louisiana and our river systems and our ports become even more important. Maybe you care about energy. Up to one-third of the nation's energy is either produced or transported through South Louisiana. 16% of the nation's refining capacity, right there in South Louisiana, connected to, to, to much more through our pipelines. I remind you, after Hurricane Katrina, gasoline prices went up 75 cents a gallon nationwide, every consumer in the country. After Hurricanes Gustav and Ike in 2008, gasoline prices spiked $1.40 a gallon, the largest price spike since the Arab oil embargo. This isn't about Louisiana. This is about the nation. Coastal Louisiana is one of the most important strategic assets to the nation. Maybe you care about the environment. It's coastal wetlands. It's the greatest loss of coastal wetlands in our nation. There's a no net loss of wetlands policy in this country. Really? The agency that regulates wetlands is causing the loss. It's unacceptable and it needs to change. The agency that's responsible for restoring and protecting coastal Louisiana takes 40 years to get a project from conception to completion. The urgency here couldn't be greater. It needs to fundamentally change. I talked about the 90% of the species in the Gulf of Mexico dependent upon this area, 98% of the commercially harvested species in the Gulf of Mexico dependent upon this area. Maybe you care about climate change. As a result of all the wetlands loss we've experienced in South Louisiana, when you lose the wetlands, you, you have uh, methane and other greenhouse gases that, that, that are released from the, uh, from, from the wetland plants and the soils that erode. A study was done that, that said that the amount of greenhouse gases released is equivalent to 80 million vehicles driving for a year. We're working on a program right now to actually try and sell the, the greenhouse gas credits associated with restoring wetlands, restoring vegetation, restoring and protecting our coastal forest. And maybe you care about innovation. You care about Louisiana getting back in front and leading the world. What we're experiencing right now in South Louisiana is relative sea level rise. We're, we're having subsidence or compaction of coastal Louisiana, which in effect 
is the same effect as, as the sea level rising. You look at projections around the world, they show that the sea level is going to be rising around the world. All coastal nations will be experiencing the same challenges that we're experiencing and fighting right now in South Louisiana. In order to protect communities, in order to sustain communities around the world, it's going to cost trillions of dollars, not millions, not billions, trillions of dollars to adapt to those projected changes. The solutions that we are developing right now, the science, the engineering, the legal, the policy, they're going to have application around the world. And so right now what's happening is that the Corps of Engineers and many, many other folks are hiring engineers and contractors and scientists from around the world. And they come here and they work on a niche issue and they leave. They take the solutions, they take the experience, they take the knowledge with them. We've got to get on the front end of this. We've got to centralize the expertise. We've got to collate the information. We've got to build the knowledge base right here and be ready to tap this trillion dollar industry as we move forward. We have invested so far over $17 billion since Hurricane Katrina in sustaining and improving the resiliency of South Louisiana. We believe that it's going to cost us $100 billion to protect and sustain all of coastal Louisiana. And again, the, the ability to market, um, uh, the ability to, to share our, our solutions with, with other coastal states and countries is extraordinary. And so later this year, we're going to be announcing the establishment of a new water institute, a quasi-private water institute here in Louisiana to serve as the expert on uh, coastal science. First of all, understanding that, um, that, that this isn't, a, you know, again, a north or south Louisiana thing and that it, it's about us. It's about Louisiana and our future. Um, the second thing is, is that we really need to coalesce uh, behind uh, one, uh, one mission to have the federal government pay attention, have the federal government change their policies, make investments here. You know, we were saying for years and years before Hurricane Katrina, you can spend millions of dollars being proactive or you can spend billions of dollars being reactive. And what happened to Hurricane Katrina? was that $150 billion to date has been spent responding to that disaster instead of making a fraction of that investment on the front end and saving all those lives, saving all that, preventing all that devastation, saving the impact to homes and businesses, uh, 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 threatening livelihoods, all of that could have been prevented. And, and, and there's, there's nothing to say that that couldn't happen again. And so we have got to learn those lessons, those very painful lessons, and be proactive and move quickly in order to ensure that we have a resilient state, a resilient economy in Louisiana.